Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Institute of International Affairs here in Stockholm today. A warm welcome to you who are here in the audience and also to all of you who are joining us online. Uh, today, uh, we're going to focus on some of the burning issues inter in the intersection between tech, innovation and geopolitics, which are affecting us in different ways. With some degree of oversimplification, maybe, uh, you could argue that the world is currently facing two overarching trends. There's first an unprecedented level of digitalization and technical development, which is reshaping our societies and our everyday lives, I would argue, rapidly and comprehensively. And the second is, of course, the unfortunate return of great power rivalry. And this is, uh, to a large extent, playing, la playing out uh, along the lines of democratic systems of governance versus autocratic ones, where I'm sad to say that the democracies seemingly are in a retreat. So Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine has only served to reinforce that trend, which was, of course, already there, compounding fears for, uh, for instance, disinformation and cyber campaigns with antagonistic uh, purposes. So, more specifically, we will focus on questions today like how does the technological transformation affect the rivalry between democracies and autocracies? Uh, how is global power redistributed among states and non-state actors, for instance, between the public and the private sectors? And thirdly, what could be done to better harness the power of technology for the benefit of democratic societies? So in order to help us better understand these issues, we have an outstanding panel with us today and we have a very special guest. And I'm so glad uh, to have uh, our, our very special guest today visiting from the United States, Mr. Kent Walker from Google. I will introduce you in more detail soon. Uh, we also have three eminent Swedish speakers with us, Professor Sylvia schwag Serger from Lund University, Ms. Jenny Elfsberg, Director and Head of Innovation at the Swedish Government Agency, Vinova, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Björn Fegersten, who is a senior uh, researcher here at our Institute of International Affairs. So some practicalities regarding this event. I would like to encourage everybody in the audience and you who are online to prepare your questions. Uh, and you can do that through the Q&A function. And the run of show will be that we will first ask Kent to deliver a keynote address. And then I will ask uh, Sylvia, Jenny and, and, and Bjorn to uh, give your remarks, maybe to what Kent said. And of course, from your own vantage uh, uh, points. And then there will be a bit of a discussion among the speakers, and then we'll wrap up around 11.40 or, or so. So uh, I will now start by asking Mr. Kent Walker uh, to deliver the keynote address today. Uh, Kent, you are the president and of Global Affairs and chief legal officers at, at Google and Alphabet. Uh, and I think that for 30 years you have focused on the intersection of technology, law and, and policy. Uh, you joined uh, Google in 2006 and you've led Google's advocacy on competition content, copyright and privacy. You worked with government leaders and regulators around the world. Uh, you just told me how you were kind of hopping from one capital to the other uh, in, in Europe uh, uh, this week. And, and you also uh, shared, uh, served as the first chair of the Global Internet Forum to combat terrorism. Uh, and you have overseen the creation of uh, Google's AI principles in 2018. And you became the chair of the company's Advanced Technology uh, Review uh, con uh, Council. 
And on this long list and very impressive resume, you've also held executive positions at Netscape, America Online, eBay, to mention just a, a few. Quite a resume, quite impressive, and I think highly relevant for today's uh, topics. And I think you will talk about how to protect uh, democracy in one way or, or another. So uh, a warm welcome to, to Stockholm, Kent. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, Erica, and thank you for the Institute. We appreciate both the warm welcome yeah. and the opportunity to talk about these issues today. I'll take a seat then, please. Thank you. So on 20, the 24th of February, as we all know, Russian tanks invaded Ukraine. The world watched in horror. And many were concerned that this was a, a new era, that there would be a return to the law of the jungle, the a return to mock politique, rather than collaboration across countries in solving shared problems. We were reminded yet again that we can't take democracy for granted, that democracy and the world's rules-based international order is not by any means guaranteed. Even before the invasion, there had been signs that democracy was under assault. Freedom House has found that the defining features of democracy, free and open expression and debate, free association, the rule of law, have retreated in nearly 50 countries. And that's not a one-time trend. That's a trend that we have seen over the last 10, 11 years. So I'd like to speak today about the debt that technology owes democracy and how technology can work with democracy to repay that debt. But first, let's talk for a moment about why that partnership is so critical, especially today. Democracy has always been fertile soil for innovation. Inventors flourish when they can exchange ideas, take risks, test hypotheses, and explore new avenues for inquiry and collective innovation. Democracies draw on values of openness and pluralism that allow cooperation and scientific innovation to flourish. In fact, I think it would be hard to argue that the advances made possible by democratic innovation, advances that have double lifespans and lifted billions of people out of poverty would have been possible under any other system of government. But technology can also benefit democracy itself by proving that democracies can deliver for citizens, expanding choice and raising living standards. Future generations of technology will help us combat some of our largest social problems, uh, fighting climate change, pioneering personalized medicine, raising agricultural productivity around the world. But even beyond raising living standards, and we're accustomed to technology's role in doing that, I believe that technology and innovation can also be a force for good in how democracy itself works. Democracies need at least three elements to flourish. A strong civil society where people can express ideas openly, an active and vibrant press, and third, free and fair elections that create accountability and let citizens check and balance power. So while there's no question that the abuse and misuse of technology, both from within and without, has created challenges in each of these areas, conversations over the last few months with defense leaders in Munich, with business leaders in Davos, with security experts in Eastern Europe, have made it clear that we need responsible application of technology to support democracy's essential functions. So first, how can technology help us defend the public square, safeguarding high quality speech and debate? I think tech can both promote and protect the marketplace of ideas by playing both offense and defense, facilitating free and open discourse while simultaneously combating disinformation. The early days of Silicon Valley, and as Jakob mentioned, I've, I've been working in Silicon Valley through most of my career, fostered a faith that most, more communication would be better for the world, better for all of us. And in many ways it has been, connecting people in remarkable new ways. But we've also come to recognize that abuses of those platforms can create harmful effects that lead to the spread of malicious or patently false information. We've responded by removing content that violates our, our policies, by raising up authoritative voices at critical times, rewarding trusted creators, and reducing borderline content. That requires tough calls, oftentimes millions of them a day. 
and we are working to provide more transparency into this critical process. The latest and most dramatic chapter came in connection with the invasion of Ukraine. We were all witnessing not just a military and an economic war, but also a cyber and an information war. It's an extraordinary situation that has called for extraordinary responses. YouTube took the unprecedented step of globally blocking disinformation channels, RT and Sputnik, removing more than 8,000 channels and more than 60,000 videos for violating our content policies. That's content that was minimizing the war's toll or spreading harmful lies about what was happening on the ground. Meanwhile, Google Search, Google News, and YouTube are some of the last independent sources of news about the war that remain available in Russia. On the cybersecurity front, when we saw a spike in distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks on Ukrainian websites, we protected access to information and kept sites online by bringing publishers and government websites under Google's security umbrella, a project called Project Shield. As a result of these efforts, we were proud to be the first company to receive the Ukrainian government's special peace prize, showing how important tech's role can be when the stakes are highest. And that brings me to the second cornerstone of strong functioning democracies, a free and a vibrant press, and how technology can help it adjust to the digital world. Google was founded with the mission of organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful. And over the, the years, our ad networks have provided billions of dollars of value to news publishers. And we've sponsored programs like the Google News Initiative that are partnering with publishers to create innovative tools and new approaches to reporting. Of course, internet technology has had a significant impact on newspaper business models, unbundling different categories of information, making news more competitive and more freely available. But technology can also be a key to the evolution of news business models for the digital era. As Herbert Simon said 50 years ago, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. That means that there is a growing role for editors and publishers, curators and analysts who can help us all allocate our limited attention wisely. It means there's a growing need for us to support content creators and a thriving glo global press. Finally, technology has a vital role to play when it comes to the integrity of our elections. At Google, we've long created tools and resources to make it easier for people to vote. Our services connect voters with the latest, most authoritative information about polling locations, remote voting, and election times. During election cycles, campaigns themselves face increased security threats. In the run-up to the 2022 elections here in Sweden, we've created a dedicated team to work on election issues and equip campaigns and election workers with best-in-class security tools. We're working with partners in Europe to give political campaigns access to tightened security keys. These are our strongest form of two-factor authentication. It's all part of our uh, Advanced Protection Program, the APP, which protects high-risk individuals, election officials, campaign officials, journalists, human rights activists, who have access to high visibility and sensitive information. Our threat analysis group is working to thwart cyber attacks, monitoring and exposing espionage, hacks, phishing campaigns, and taking steps to disrupt those threats. In recent months, we've disrupted coordinated attacks coming from government-backed actors from China, from Iran, from North Korea, and from Russia. And we've stopped attacks by unattributed groups to sow disinformation and fan the flames of social division. Our role is clear. We are aiming to help protect people and prevent future attacks by identifying bad actors and sharing relevant information with the public and with governments. These are all examples of the ways tech is helping today across the public square, across the free press, and across elections themselves. But defending democracy and the rules-based international order is a task that requires tech, civil society, and governments to work together. An Edelman research survey found that people often think of governments and NGOs as well-intentioned but ineffective. And they often thought of companies as effective, but maybe not always well-intentioned. But when the two worked together, they went to the upper right-hand quadrant, thought to be both well-intentioned and more effective.
So to sum up, democracy is at a watershed moment. There's a risk that democracies turn inward, focusing strictly on domestic challenges, rather than defending the liberal democratic international order. And technology, too, is at a crossroads, with a concern that worries about the abuses of technology obscure its many benefits and the way it can contribute to society. But technologists, too, need to engage in the fight for democracy. In 1996, John Perry Barlow, who was a lyricist for the Grateful Dead, wrote a declaration of independence of cyberspace, arguing that the internet was beyond any government's laws. Well, perhaps it's now time for a declaration of interdependence of cyberspace. Our growing technological connections have become so important to our daily lives that technologists need to work even more closely with governments on new and agile rules to promote progress, national security, and the defense of the public square. International frameworks from the UN to the WTO to the OECD can be useful starting places as we work to promote international alignment, and only governments can drive that critical work. We need governments committed to open democratic processes to step up and to work together to reaffirm international norms of access to information and to the free and open exchange of ideas. At Google, we're eager to roll up our sleeves and help. We leave the politics to the politicians, but that doesn't mean we leave the defense of the public square to others. Nor does it mean we take lightly the experience and ideas of government leaders in the cause of protecting democracy. We hear the summons to defend democracy's essential components, the open exchange of views, an independent press, and free and fair elections. And in moments of uncertainty and crisis, responsible tech companies feel a duty to do what our engineers do best, unlock solutions to the most pressing problems. We undertake, we undertake that task with an appreciation that those solutions will be, must be, the product of collaboration building on the kind of collective innovation that has always made democracies stronger than their adversaries. Thank you very much. Th thanks, uh, thanks uh, a lot, Kent, for those extremely uh, pertinent words. What you're saying about how to protect, the, I think, the most important manifestation of democracies, elections, for instance, is... Uh, very well taken, I think, and, and uh, the comments about uh, collaboration between uh, government, civil society and, and, and tech are uh, absolutely uh, key, I think, and, and issues I think we will soon come back to. to. So uh, let me now uh, invite uh, the rest of uh, today's panel. Uh, please, you could come up all three. Uh, and <clears throat> I will start by giving uh, the word to uh, Professor Sylvia Schwag uh, Serger. Uh, you have uh, spent, uh, I think, more than 20 years uh, designing, implementing, and studying research and innovation policy, particularly in Europe and, and, and China, uh, Sylvia. You have an impressive background as the deputy vice chancellor of uh, Sweden's biggest university. I think I'm correct when I'm saying that, University of, of, of Lund. You've also been uh, director of international affairs at the Swedish government uh, agency uh, for innovation, uh, Vinova. So I think you have a very interesting background, interesting experiences. I, I've asked you to prepare some comments apropos today's themes, but don't hesitate to also uh, provide uh, any, any comments already on what uh, Kent just said, but we'll come back to that in a, in a discussion. So please, uh, uh, Sylvia, the, the, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Jakob, and uh, thanks a lot also for your remarks, Kent. And I, there are a lot of things that I completely agree with, um, which is, I think, what you finished up with, that both technology in a way and democracy are at a crossroads, and there is a potential for a very strongly, positively mutually reinforcing relationship between technology and democracy. Um, I've thought a lot about the link between technology and geopolitics, which is the theme of, of, this, of this seminar today. And um, I think some of the things you touched upon, which are, um, if you look at a historical perspective, it's the rise of disruptive technologies that also tends to lead to political destabilization. And I'm wondering if this is one of these phases that we are in right now, and whether the rise of disruptive technologies is actually partially contributing to the return of geopolitics. Mm. So that's the first thing that I'm sort of thinking about a lot right now, because for a long time we talked about the trade wars between China and the US, and I always 
from the beginning, as somebody who's been trying to understand China for the last 20 years, I always said it's not about trade, it's about technology. And I think that's something maybe we were a little bit late to realize outside of um, China. Modifying a little bit your point about the close link between technology and democracy. So, I, like, as I said, I've spent 20 years trying to understand uh, research and innovation policy in China. Um, among other things, as the science counselor for the, the Swedish government in Beijing. And um, in those 20 years, I don't know how many times I've been proven wrong whenever I thought and, and thought I had made a good case that, as I think you said, Kent, that technology sort of requires democracy and flourishes under democracy. I feel like I've been proven wrong time and time again that both innovation and technological development actually have thrived enormously also under an autocracy. Um, and I think this is one of the conundrums that we're sort of left with, is that technology can both strengthen or undermine both democracies and autocracies. And then it comes to the point that you made initially, Jakob, is how do we harness technology? And I think you spoke about that, Kent, that we need this kind of fruitful interaction um, between technology and democracy. Um, at the end of the day, I think, again, I think in times like these, it's really useful to look at economic history. And of course, I'm not objective because I'm from the Department of Economic History. But um, one of the, I just hope it's not my, because I set my alarm for No, no, we can. No, leave it. <laughs> can it's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but one of the things that we come back to time and time again, and if you look at people who have studied the great technology surges throughout history, is the role of the state. Right? The role of the state in not only harnessing technology, but in bring, being a credible and effective um, institution for setting framework conditions um, and for providing this balance between individual freedoms and governance. And I think this is one of the big contests of our time, which is which political system is able to provide this role. So um, my comments uh, or my thoughts go a lot around this. What does this mean for the US? What does this mean for China? And what does this mean for Europe? And one of the new things I think that we're dealing with in this era also, which is unprecedented compared to previous rises of technological, uh, disruptive technologies, is of course the rise of global corporations like Google and Microsoft um, who have unprecedented concentration of technology and global reach. So I think, as you're probably aware of, but for, for the Swedish audience, I mean, um, Amazon's R&D budget in 2020 was twice as large as Sweden's R&D budget in total. Um, Google's was also significantly larger than Sweden's total R&D budget. So that raises very fundamental questions of what is the reach of the state? What are the means of the state to harness technology? Um, and I. I won't go into too much detail, but the thing that concerns me right now a lot is that I think um, the US and Europe, and this is something that's being discussed right now, need to really join forces in defending democracy. But as somebody who's grown up in Germany and was educated, I'm, I'm German and American and, and of Chinese origin, I can say that I think, unfortunately, right now, I think that the US and, the, and Europe have drifted apart considerably in the past 20 years for many reasons. And this is something that perhaps is not always fully realized on the US side uh, when trying to interact with Europe. So I do think that, as you said, this is a watershed moment for democracy and for democracies to work together to harness technology as a force for good. But I think certain things have to happen to make sure that this uh, takes place. And my final comment will be about Europe, which I think is lacking, lagging behind when it comes to the mastery of key technologies, both behind the US and behind China. Perhaps not so much in research, but definitely in innovation. And we can see that in the fact that, the US, uh, that Europe ha does not have the tech giants that the US has or that China has. Um, I think Europe also lags behind in linking security and innovation. Um, in this age of geopolitics, for historical reasons in Europe, we've been very careful to separate defense issues and innovation. And I think we need to rethink this uh, relationship. And this is something that the US and China do a lot more effectively than Europe does. But I do think that Europe has some assets which are underexploited right now, which is that I think Europe is a credible proponent of international collaboration, where both the US and China have lost a bit in credibility. 
Um, and this is something I think we could harness to everybody's benefit. Um, and I also think that you, the, Europe right now is quite an attractive system. When I look at the young people that we attract, for example, to the University of Lund from all over the world who used to go primarily to um, the US uh, or the UK but are now increasingly considering uh, continental Europe, I think we have become more attractive than we were in the past, relatively speaking, for international talent and, as, a, as I said, a proponent of, the tr of a global rules-based international order. I'm not going to talk too long. Those were my introductory comments. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia. Very interesting questions there, I think. Has disruptive technology actually contributed to uh, the uh, return of, of geopolitics? And under which system does actually innovation flourish uh, best? And, and how can Europe and, and US work uh, together better? What's the role? I mean, extremely interesting. And that's exactly how we want it to be here, a little bit uh, challenging. We'll get back to that uh, very soon. But uh, I'd like now to, to invite you uh, Jenny Elfsberg, uh, you are the director and head of innovation management uh, at uh, the Swedish government uh, uh, innovation agency Vinova since about two years, I believe. And before that, you have quite an exciting background in one of uh, Sweden's major international corporations, uh, Volvo, uh, uh, where you uh, <coughs> led the uh, uh, innovation lab in Silicon Valley, I, I, I believe, a uh, couple of, of years. Uh, and uh, I think you will also talk about uh, how democracies need to uh, stay committed to democracy how, somehow from the corporate and Vinova perspective. So please, Jenny, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I got so excited hearing those two speakers are like, let's have dinner and speak for hours. <laughs> we'll have lunch afterwards, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but what I really would like to start with is, yeah, what Jacob just said, that democracies need to stay uh, stable and stand up for democracy and openness and international collaboration. It's fairly easy to get frightened and, you know, close borders and stop collaborating and all that, and that could definitely lead to a really bad spiral because, you know, trust is built on openness and openness is built on trust. So if we react too uh, protectively when things are happening now, we can really cause big troubles for the future. So that I think is important. And at the same time, I think I, I talked about, you know, standing still, like being stable in democracy. I would also say that I don't think stability is the future, actually. We are seeing the climate change and the geopolitical uh, things we're seeing right now. I mean, it's not going to get less because of what we have caused to, to Earth. And also, uh, knowing the younger generation, this stability, like how uh, countries have been built up, it's not how young people want to work. They want to be global citizens, they want to be digi-physical. And I, I think it's really educational and important to look to the past to learn from, but the future is not going to be anything like the past. It's going to be digi-physical, it's going to be the open borders for talents and competencies are finding each other, whatever countries are going to do. Just, I mean, if you don't believe me, you could spend some time on GitHub and see how collaboration is happening there. Uh, but I, I do believe y you, you see this as well. Uh, the interdependency between the different private public sector, large companies, small companies, uh, the legal authorities, I mean, all that is really going to be crucial when we build, shape the future that we want to see for the world, for democracies. And uh, then, of course, being at Vinova, I need to talk about how Agenda 2030 is super central as a compass towards where we all should, should strive for. We do have technology. I'm a te technology optimist and uh, engineer by heart and brains. Uh, but I also know the importance of the community, like tech for all, like uh, if we make really awesome solutions that only the rich people or only the 
the people living in democracies, we are losing so many opportunities, so we need to design for all and uh, help shaping the future even for the countries that are not democratic today. We can do it. I'm not saying anyone should be naive. I'm not saying we should just hope for the best, but it is possible for to design for for the for the good. Just look at, well, let's be a little bit geeky and talk about Web3. Okay, right now it's more of a Ponzi scheme, but for the future with blockchain and all that, we can get radical transparency. And if you don't want to be in the transparency system with the uh, distributed uh, power, decision powers, maybe you're not going to be part of it. So I think we have so many opportunities with tech development. I think we need to understand that we, you guys, me, everyone, and our children, mostly maybe, to stand up for democracy and make sure we, we keep this open world that we believe in. And at the same time, we don't need to be naive and we don't need to pretend that the bad things aren't happening, but we can be balanced there, I think. That's my... Thank you so much, uh, Jenny, for those uh, comments. I. I, I fully agree. I mean, we. what is our future like if not even more digitalized and, and connected? And I mean, tech is here to stay and the the rapid uh, changes and developments are, are... So we need to harness it, whether we like it or not. And, and what you're saying about uh, defending democracies and also I like your point about the SDGs and how we need to kind of do this in an inclusive uh, way, really. Uh, I mean, you were speaking about the uh, youth, but I'm th I think you're also talking about the world outside, maybe Northern or Western Europe or North America, and, and how to stand up for the democ democratic values while just uh, accepting the fact that tech is here to, to, to stay. So uh, very interesting, Jenny. We'll definitely come back to that. Uh, <clears throat> let me now turn, finally, uh, for, for last comments before we open up, uh, to, uh, to my dear colleague, Bjorn, Dr. Bjorn Fegersten. You were, until very recently, the head of our Europe uh, uh, program, but you are still continuing with research at the Institute, uh, where you've followed the role of tech in international relations and the quickly unfolding, uh, uh, shall we call it, uh, geopolitical tectonic shifts uh, which are happening in Europe and across uh, the world that we've seen the last few years. Uh, I think you will t today talk, well, you're probably going to comment on the other speakers, but one part of your speciality is, of course, uh, the, the Europe uh, angle uh, and, and how the tech and geopolitics are, are intersecting. So maybe with those words, Bjorn, can I give you the floor for the last... Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, I'll make a few quick comments and I've already been interesting listening to you. I'll try to tie into some of your thoughts. Um, but I had three kind of ideas. One is the the fact that we see an increasingly blurring line between civilian and military applications of technology. Uh, we see it in, in almost all kind of new and emerging tech, like artificial intelligence or, or quantum encryptions, uh, biotech, etc. And, and also the way rather simple new technologies can be weaponized. Uh, Kent talked about the, the war in Ukraine, where we see cheap commercial drones uh, dropping very old school hand grenades, etc. Um, so obvious connections between civil and military technology. And I wonder if this is more of a challenge for open societies than closed ones. At least we see that, that China has really made an effort and a strategy out of accelerating this trend with a military uh, civilian fusion. Um, but the US is also quite good at kind of at least uh, making civilian technology accessible and adaptable for, for military means. And I think Europe is probably, as Silvia was pointing out, uh, lagging behind here and, and there's much work to be, to be done. Because of course this kind of, many of our systems are, are really built on this separation between the civilian use and military use when it comes to export control, funding of, of research, uh, norms of usage, etc. So there's, there's lots of work to, to do there. 
Uh, and of course, this also challenges, I would say, the, the state's role in, in general. Uh, more non-state actors will have more of, of influence. Uh, they can influence, you talked about elections, uh, our warfare, uh, etc. So it, to, the, to a large extent, challenges the, the role of the states when, when also military technology becomes so uh, accessible for, for non-state actors. Um, my other point was about Europe and, and where we are, and, and that was also raised the, the need for innovation. Um, I mean, because the, a modern economy is really about controlling the, the resources and the flows of, of technology um, and in order to, to reach societal and, and political outcomes. And, and here I think Europe is, is also lagging behind if we want to be crude. I mean, a lot in today's economy is about grabbing our attention, right, as, as consumers. And, and today, to a large extent, uh, the, the attentions of European consumers is grabbed by American firms, to a large extent using uh, technology produced in, in Asia. Um, is that a problem? Um, well, perhaps, perhaps not. We spend a lot of time talking about European autonomy, strategic autonomy or, or strategic sovereignty. There's lots of concept about this feeling need that we need to be more, take more responsibility for our own fate, uh, have more control over critical flows in our societies. But right now, the direction is going in, in, in or it's going in the wrong direction. Uh, we will have less control over these kind of technical flows. So I would just second what was said before. The, 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 the right way to address this is probably not to be become more kind of protectionist and, and force European, by European or a Euro cloud or whatever, but really to boost our own capacity to be a player and not only a playground when it comes to technology. And I would love to see European countries discuss R&D spending in the same way that they've now discussed uh, defense spending, especially now when we're discussing NATO membership and these kind of holy limits of 2% or 3% uh, to some countries. Uh, it would be interesting to have the same kind of discussion on, on R&D and innovation because that will be as important whether we talk civilian power in the future or, or military power. Um, and then finally, uh, cooperation, what democracies can actually do. And uh, Kent, you pointed out, the, of course, the, the value of a rules-based order, but that rules-based order is, is, is under quite some stress uh, right now. And um, of course, there are enormous needs uh, for democracies to address when it comes to norms, standardization, different aspects of the overall kind of innovation chain. Uh, and there's also frameworks, of course. We have uh, true multilateral bodies, uh, UN bodies. We have bilateral uh, relationships. And, and the US has a full network of the AUKUS, the Quad, the uh, TTC, Trade and Technology Council with the EU. So there's a, a wide plethora of possible interaction forms. And, and one idea now is whether do we need more of a democratic club to, to collaborate and cooperate on technology. Um, uh, the Brits have, have suggested something called the D10. The American think tank product is the T12. Uh, the idea of a few kind of leading tech democracy joining forces and cooperating. And maybe that's not a bad idea. Maybe it's some issues we need to solve together among democracy. But it also raises, of course, quite complicated questions because some areas sharing be best practice, perhaps procuring uh, technology together can be done in these kind of small club-like uh, uh, forums <laughs> among democracies, but other areas like export control or standardization, you want to have a, a large group as possible apart from the country that you possibly do want to cooperate with. Otherwise, you'll just give your competitor a huge market if you lock in your innovation uh, to a very small group of democracies. Um, so while it's a really good idea to have more cooperation among democracy, I still see that this is going to be a pretty kind of fussy uh, cooperation environment for the decade to come to get this right, to, to both have the uh, good cooperation and strengthen democracies at the same time and, and markets. So uh, I'll stop with that, but that's my comment. Mm. Thanks a lot, uh, Bjorn. And I was just going to ask you, Kent, to maybe st you could maybe start yeah, by okay. making some comments to what the three Absolutely. previous speakers said. So please, Kent. So, so many rich topics here. Uh, let, me, let me start with the last point and then come back to some of your earlier thoughts. Uh, I, I would remind you that in addition to the T12 and the D9, the D9 was 
driven by Sweden's role in pulling together the digital uh, forward countries in, in Europe. And this continues to be an important way of, of framing a lot of these issues. So if the, as we're seeing more transatlanticism, I would say the conversations in Munich were more positive and collaborative than any I've witnessed in recent years. Uh, I think there's an awful lot to be done with regard to the different regions working together. Uh, after all, Europe and the United States collectively are a market of about a billion people, which one might argue is sort of necessary scale in a global economy. And there's an awful lot to be done that is already being done with new investments in semiconductors, for example, and thinking about Coming back to your point, Terry, about the notion of investment in basic research. I think democracies traditionally have been strong on the basic side of things. Autocracies stronger, perhaps, on the execution and implementation. The more we can lean into those strengths with investments in R&D, academia, et cetera, I think the stronger and more successful we'll ultimately be. And then you also raise the provocative and, I think, important question about the rise of the role of disruptive technologies mm -hmm. for democracies. This is, of course, not a new problem, as you know from your history. I, I, you could go back to the rise of the printing press uh, and some of the dislocations that resulted, or the, the post office, which was itself a technological innovation, or the telegraph in the early 1800s, which was said to annihilate space and time. Uh, radio, well, actually, the rise of mass newspapers, radio, and the populism that came with that. Television, of course, in the United States, which Marshall McLuhan called the vast wasteland of television and the social implications of that. Cable television, which itself tends to narrow cast to particular audiences, and then of course the internet. In each of these cases, we have needed to develop new codes, new social norms, new regulatory environments, to absorb them and make them constructive players in society. So I think it's a very important yeah. issue and one, not a new issue, yeah. and one we can take some solace from that, but that doesn't mean not an important issue. I think it's front and center of a lot of the work we need to do here. Excellent, Ken. Maybe maybe you would like to comment no, on I, that I, right I, away, Sylvia. Yeah, yeah, just just one comment. I completely agree, yeah. and I think my concern right now is, and as you said, Bjorn, I also, and I, I know Bjorn, you've been working on science diplomacy. It'd be interesting to hear how that might tie into this, but. My concern right now is that we need, because all the examples you mentioned, and it's totally true, I'm wondering if we're in an era where we have an unprecedented global reach mm. of both the impact of technology on power, but also, of course, of the interconnectedness and the global challenges that our world is facing. So we do need, in some way, global governance or some kind of partial global governance more than ever before, at the same time as perhaps the largest democracy is quite concerned with itself. You know, it's so so some of the biggest threats to democracy, I would argue, to be a little bit, pro bit provocative, are coming from within the US right now. So we have this problem that we need global governance and we need Europe and the US to collaborate to um, provide the right framework conditions in order for these technologies to have the beneficial effect on society and humanity that they can. But governments are concerned with other things. And this is something that I'm not sure how we're gonna get out and out of. And so of course, now under the current um, political situation, we have a lot of dialogue with the US, but I think all Europeans are sort of looking to the US and wondering what's gonna happen in a year or two. And this is not sort of the conditions that are super conducive for long-term trust or openness, as you said. So I, I completely agree, but I see sort of concerns because of the unprecedented reach. Uh, for, for good and bad, I, I would yes. say, right? Because obviously technology has had this impact, coupled with trade, yes. of being able to raise living standards in dramatic, unprecedented ways. Yes. We've never brought a billion people out of extreme poverty in 20 or 30 years. Yeah. But at the same time, you see the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, for example, having an impact on global grain supplies mm. and potentially creating famine in Africa mm. in a way that would have been exactly. unimaginable a generation ago. Exactly, exactly. Jenny or Bjorn, would you like to ship in? Uh, well, just short on, on this with science diplomacy, I've, I think, so that's the idea that that you can use science and technology collaboration as a way of also uh, spreading norms and, well, using it for political reasons, and those can be benign, or but it could also be for, for strength and more for kind of geopolitical reasons, but the, the use of science. And, and I have, here I think that the pendulum has really swung quite far from like the the heydays of liberal globalization when we thought that 
scientific cooperation could also solve like a very solutionist idea that, that there's nothing uh, science cooperation can't really solve mm. when it comes to climate change or wars, etc. And now the, the pendulum has swung. We talk about, we talk about weaponization of everything, of uh, scientific collaboration. Uh, states are increasingly kind of locking down or restricting their, their science and, and uh, innovation spheres uh, from others. I, I saw, I think I saw a commission document including the world. They were looking for, for knowledge, knowl European knowledge autonomy. Uh, of course, some kind of oxymoron uh, of terms. It's, it's very difficult to reach autonomy in knowledge. Knowledge is, is a collaborative effort, but it's, and we see in relation to, to Russia, uh, the way we have cut down, and they have cut down uh, reciprocally, like almost all research connections. And this is something that we believed would, would kind of foster at least our ability to spread norms and, and help the, in the, the kind of the long march of democracy. And now we're backtracking on almost all of those initiatives. And so I wonder if the, the pendulum has kind of swung too far into a more protectionist stance also affecting science and technology. It's, mm -hmm. it's slightly worrying. I, I <coughs> so I Although I it's for good reasons yeah. perhaps in no, I, 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 I really uh, take away your point about you as firms producing in Asia for consumers in Europe that kind of shows that the interdependence is, is, is of course still there whether we like it or not and to imagine keep uh, completely cutting that I think uh, is simply un, un, unrealistic. So uh, yes, the pendulum is probably at least in the rhetoric swinging a bit too far we need to collaborate somehow and on this theme of collaboration i was thinking about you are again uh, representing preeminent uh, private uh, company but we have representatives of of government here as well how do you and the rest of the panel see that virtuous collaboration between as you mentioned uh, government tech and and uh, to some extent also uh, civil society of course in the protection of, of the democracies that we hold dear, as, as you as just said. What, what, I mean, and I'd like to hear also from government representatives yeah. and, uh, and, and uh, academia here, but maybe if I start with you, Kent, how, how do you see that? W when, when does it work best and how does it work then? Sure, uh, so perhaps the best way to start is with an example from a conversation we had this morning with the Swed Swedish agency, which is charged with helping protect the election that will be coming up in September. Mm -hmm. We have a very open and transparent uh, working relationship where we are sharing information, trend information, uh, cyber attacks as that we are seeing on our systems, uh, warnings that they are seeing. This has been very positive and is modeled or, or reflects work we've done on elections in Europe, in Germany, France, elsewhere over the years. So that kind of sharing of information where there are, there's signals intelligence, human intelligence, that different agencies have different competencies and different expertise, that's been very productive. As we're working on a regulatory framework, trying to make sure that we have full input from both the guidance of democracies on democratic values of how best to balance privacy and competition and content moderation with the, the technical details that sometimes our engineers can contribute to the conversation mm. about how things will work out in practice has been very useful. Mm. But Annie, you may have other uh, I think that's an excellent yeah. example. And I mean, so <laughs> topical. We all know what has happened over the last few years with interference of sorts in, in, the, in the elections. So that's, that's a great role that, that Google play, is playing there, I think. But uh, would anyone, maybe, I mean, you are actually a government agency <laughs> representing Jenny. So what, what yeah. would you like to say to this? Huh? Yeah, well, I, I think that's a good point. I, what I wanted to say is that I think we, when we want to make uh, that radical collaboration where government, private sector, public sector, you know, when we want that to happen is uh, we, I think we get the direction right, like what we want a, a successful fair election or maybe f combat climate change or like whatever it is. So the direction is never a problem and I think any, anyone intellectually understands, yeah, we need to do this together. Then we have the differences in cadence, like a small startup runs faster than a big corporate, and a big corporate sometimes runs faster than public sector. Like that, like understanding that we need these different perspectives and the uh, transsectorial, transdisciplinary connection. It's it's so easy to understand that it's needed and so hard to do because when it comes to cooperation, we all just biologically pr prefer 
conformity, like everyone should just conform. And I think that is a also a big uh, challenge because if we want this loosely connected aligned system that is all making the wanted future happen, digitally and physically, and we don't understand that the wanted diversity is, you know, we don't realize that we strive for conformity, it's going to cause a lot of problems. So we have to understand, I'm going to, maybe Google is fixing a, a solution. Uh, some system collaborators are making it operate on one level, and then you go from region to global, like all that. Just understand that these different perspectives, it doesn't happen because we meet in a room. It's really, it's mm. going to take hard work. You know, like a really good marriage, you need to put effort <laughs> into it. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to say just to that is that there are so many solutions in this because we can, if we like radically accept, this is going to be hard work, but it's going to be worth it because future of democracy in the digital physical world, it's, it's needed. But I'm what I what I see is that we like we've been experimenting with missions oriented ways of working. The direction is easy, like the vision, what we want to accomplish. Everyone is on board, no matter where you come from. And then you can have really good workshops where you get this is the system we want to like. This is where we came from. This is what we want to do. And then you come to the like the middle step, the how, and that's where the disconnects are happening because you want to talk to the people that talk like you. I think that is really the, <coughs> the danger when we want government and companies and yeah, mm. different actors to collaborate. Thank you for putting that darkly. Maybe would you like to ship in on this one as well? Uh, uh, just, Please. just briefly, I mean, at the risk of repeating myself, I really think we're at a transformative moment in history and transformation brings inherently instability. Um, and that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Mm. But I think one of the tr struggles we have right now, and I completely agree with Bjorn that I think, and you, as you said, we're, we're overshooting in some way in our responses. At the same time as we're not acting, we're not responding government, ac government academia, I think is not, has not found the way to respond in an agile, effective, incredible manner to these transformative f changes that we're, that we're seeing. So we have this tension that companies, as you said, because of the force of competition, you know, they will find responses to, to quite challenging mm -hmm. changes in their environment. But I think government and academia, and this is one of the reasons I returned to academia after 20 years in policymaking, are not, you know, w they don't, they're not, they're not, they're a bit at a loss right now of how to handle this. And that's creating problems. Mm -hmm. So, and then my, my last point would just be that I think, as you were saying, I mean, when, if we try to find these, uh, like you were talking about, we need a different interaction between the different actors. And it means that we also need to assume slightly different roles because um, even the chair of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce, I think in Beijing said recently, you know, even companies need to find their red lines. Like they need to figure out where, you know, how far am I willing to go and where, it is, where, ca where can I not go? And so I think this kind of blurring or this changing of who we are as actors and how we interact with each other. And then my final point is about the overshooting beyond is I think we've been in a way sort of missionizing or moralizing in our model. You know, if you just do what we do in the West or in democracies, then you will become like us. And we're not really happy with the fact that it hasn't turned out that way, but I think we need to get much more transactional. So there are a lot of collaborations that benefit all everybody and these should continue. And so I think in a way, while we stand f firm on democracy, we need to also not overshoot in a sense that everything we do with non-democracies is evil. That is not beneficial. And there we need to be a lot more pragmatic and transactional. That's a very interesting point. Are companies, uh, tech companies becoming more regional? Are we dealing with more open and closed societies? How do we actually deal? Okay. Kent, do you want to I, respond to this? I do. Just quickly on this. We have, our, our teams have coined an awful word called glocal, that you simultaneously need to be global and local to respond to these kinds of concerns. And that's quite true. But to come back to sort of the shared point that the two of you were making a moment ago, this notion for coordination, collaboration, almost an intermediate gearing, uh, I think is, is critical. In the United States, there was a, a hearing a couple of years back in Congress where one of the congressmen said, send in the nerds. You know, we actually needed to have more engineers and more government bureaucrats on both sides speaking each other's language uh, and recognizing the complexities that they each face. I think that's a, an important step. We co-sponsored with the OECD a conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, about a month ago on the notion of agile regulation. Mm -hmm. 
How do we reinvent the regulatory process to deal with fast-moving technological developments, geopolitical developments, which is difficult. I, we don't mean to under, underestimate the, the challenges inherent in that, but it's, it's also necessary mm -hmm. because otherwise, you know, by the f if it takes five years to come up with new regulation, technology may have moved another five years in that, that intervening space. Mm -hmm. Did you want to ship in on this? Otherwise, I'd like to open up for questions here very soon. No, open up for questions, sorry. Uh, so, what did you say? Glocal, Glugal? Or uh, gl uh, glocal, <laughs> glocal <laughs> is, is what we're trying for. Glugal or avoid. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, thank you. Fascinating. There's a lot of issues which has been put on the table here right now. Uh, and I want to, we, we only have um, some 15 minutes to go, but I'd really like to open up for, for questions from the audience. I already see one hand uh, uh, over there. So do we have a, a mic? So please for the gentleman over there. Uh, and please uh, present yourself and put your questions briefly today. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I have a, a short observation and a short question. Uh, the observation is this. I think it's incredibly important that you're holding this uh, a meeting. Uh, I, and I want to congratulate the Institute for doing it. Um, just by listening for almost an hour, the number of gray areas, dilemmas, moral uh, issues, uh, ambiguities that I have come up warrant, in my view, more of the same. And uh, I hope the Institute will uh, organize similar or comparable events, hopefully with Professor Schwab in, involved, that would be a great success. Now, my uh, my question is basically to uh, Mr. Walker, um, and it comes to the heart of what this is all about, technology and democracy. I mean, everybody is screaming when, you know, things are available on Twitter, on Google, whatever, because how can that still be there? And you yourself say that, you know, you're actively combating misinformation. Now, that's where the democracy comes in. How do you define misinformation? Mm -hmm. Is that a democratic process or is this mm -hmm. Google determined? I mean, how in practice? Do, because again, you know, there's so many gray areas. What to you is democracy, to me is a dictatorship, what to you is a rightful uh, point, is to another is misinformation. How do you do that? Okay. Uh, and please, if you could just introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Van Liemt, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So, Kent, that's yes. a question clearly for yeah. you. I'm I sure others are eager to ta have it I go on it. But I, I, I will pro provide grist, and you all can, can correct me as we go. Uh, so let me respond first to your comment and then to your question. On your comment, we face a variety of what I call digital dilemmas, where there are tensions between important democratic values, like privacy or competition or content moderation, each in some tension with the others. So a privacy regulator might want a company to keep information close, where a competition regulator might want us to spread it around to rivals. Uh, there's a tension between treating everybody equally the way you might a competition regulator might want and distinguishing between higher and lower quality content the way content moderation might want you to. There's a tension between privacy, which fa favors anonymity, Mm. and content moderation, which favors reputation and maybe limiting anonymity to improve the quality of public conversation. These are questions, and now I'll come to your question, these are questions that can only be answered, the balance only struck by democracies, different agencies working together, because each society may want to draw those lines in different places. So coming now to your question of how do we try to decide what's disinformation, misinformation, and harmful misinformation, harmful disinformation. As a search engine, and I, I like to think of Google as an antidote to fake news, and generally speaking, I think we do a generally good job of surfacing relevant, useful information. We can't go out every time someone says their neighbor's house is green and it's really red, we have no way of going out and validating what the truth is. We are, in that sense, a, a, truth engi a search engine, not a truth engine. But there are certain limited cases where democratic agencies have made a finding with regard to what's accurate or not accurate and potentially un uh, misinformation that is harmful. So let's use the pandemic. If the WHO or a public health authority has determined that a certain cure is, is quack medicine and would actually be harmful to people, we will, on a service like YouTube, not accept ads, promoting those kinds of, of fake remedies, and actually not allow people to say that, um, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, taking apricot pits will cure cancer, 
or doing something in particular will, will solve COVID. So we do take, in limited cases, those sorts of steps. We also have policies with regard to foreign state actor interference with elections, et cetera. So we, in, in narrow and targeted ways, informed by democratic values, we try and take out action against harmful misinformation while recognizing that there will always be some forms of misinformation out there on the web. And part of what a search engine does is to allow and expose that information so there's public access to it so that academics and others can correct it. Anyone else who would like to uh, mention or comment on that? No. Not if there are other questions. Ah. Like. Okay, so do, do we have any other questions here in the audience? Yes, gentlemen over there, please. <coughs> I would like to address the question to Sylvia because I think she's got the relevant background. Um, it's concerning surveillance. I think uh, people of background from Germany understand this very well, more than Swedes have any yeah. idea of. Um, my question to you is, can you trust your car? And I'll give you an example of a car. It's a new car, it's the Polestar. And it does intersect these three things. China, it has a big corporation which mines data, and it has the consumer involved. And I think the consumer is very weak in this territory. I'd like to hear your opinions. Would you consider buying such a car? And could you please also introduce yourself? I'm Richard Cohen. I'm, I was born in Britain, and now I'm a Swedish citizen. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's for you, Sylvia. Yeah, thanks a lot. And <coughs> I fully understand that question. And as somebody who, who grew up in Germany, and this is conversations I'd have also have had also with many uh, Chinese colleagues, I, I am quite sus suspicious of a lot of things. Um, and I think we need to have a healthy degree of suspicion, which also partially explains, I think, why Germany has been not always the fastest adopter, adopter of new technologies. Um, but it also ties into the previous question, which is we're living in a world which is predominantly gray. So it doesn't mean that everything that is being that uh, you know that I am being uh, mined for, if you want to say, or that's being monitored about me, is necessarily evil. Um, so I think I am brought up as somebody who grew up in the 80s in Germany with a, I don't know. I, I used to think it was an excessive suspicion of uh, all kinds of surveillance. Um, now I just think. It's not a bad thing to have, but you also don't have to be paranoid because there are we're dealing in a gr we're in a gray world, and I think this is one of the problems is that we're trying to we're moving all the time to the extremes, where things are either evil or they're good, or things are either you know shouldn't happen at all or they should happen all the time. And as you said, Bjorn, I think unfortunately we're going to have to find ways in companies, in governments, in academia to navigate the gray. And I'm not sure, and that we need different tools for that than we have today. That would be my answer. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Bjorn would like to ship in on this one as well. No, actually, I have a question. <laughs> you have a question? Please go ahead. <laughs> to my co-panelists, uh, especially to, to Kent and Jenny, representing uh, different uh, aspects of the kind of public-private partnerships. We've discussed, uh, to a large extent, kind of ourselves, open societies, and how they work and where the, the strengths are. And, uh, I mean, a few years ago, people argued that closed societies or, or autocratic societies couldn't innovate, but now we know that they actually can, and they are quite competitive. So I just wondered, what's, what's your take on what actually works in these? Uh, why, why are they, to some extent, successful when it comes to innovation? Is it, is it funding? Is it political uh, interference and decision-making? Is it more relaxed uh, rules? It's easier to drive around a, a car without a driver in a, in a city, perhaps in China, than in, in Italy? or what What's it, wh why are they, to some extent, successful? And what's, what are we up against here? I'll defer to my engineering colleague to answer first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would not claim that I have the answer, but from uh, the friends I have, the engineering friends I have in China, I would say that some of it is most probably because uh, the directionality from the state is pretty uh, clear. Like we're going to accomplish this, like a moonshot uh, philosophy from the state. And then, of course, with their uh, way of leading <laughs> the country, of course, that's uh, part of it. So like the PhD students I know, of, they they feel they can share wi amongst each other to have a, you know, a closed, a tight-knit community of doing the same research. 
So then if I wanna, if I wanna collaborate with Sylvia's PhD students that's in Sweden, well, we could, but in, for the students I know in China, they easily find their peers and can boost that. Then of course, China is not, I mean, it's, uh, this is probably not very political said, but I would say that it helps to feel a little bit like you're gonna show the world. Like I'm, I'm not mm. working on political level, but I know when I work with Volvo Group, the, the engineers I worked with in Poland, that was a country catching up, they had, I don't know, more conviction to do their work, so maybe that could be influencing uh, the Chinese successful tech. Mm. And just to add a, a few thoughts to that, I think for, for big bet innovation, you've seen the Chinese government investing very heavily in dedicated areas, uh, and that has been to some degree successful. Although the diversity of innovation that the democratic approach brings mm. is in some ways more resilient, more robust, because you're planting lots of different seeds, would, and it's hard to know in advance exactly which ones mm. will be the most uh, compelling. A lot of telephone chargers. A, a, a lot of telephone chargers, <laughs> but ultimately, you know, you end up with a pretty good telephone charger if you can get people aligned uh, as that technology matures. So I think there's an interesting balance of how much you want to double down in a very focused, directed way, and how much you want to let a thousand flowers bloom, to borrow a Chinese expression, um, and hope that some of those will flourish in good ways. Thank you for that question, Bjorn. I, I have a question from online, and we're slowly wrapping up. So this is a question for Sylvia, but to the three other panelists, why don't you prepare to just in 30 seconds try to uh, crystallize what you've taken away as the most exciting and most uh, challenging things as you see ahead here. But as you are thinking of that, uh, Sylvia, the question from, the, uh, from online or the online audience is for you. Oh, it's similar a little bit to what was just put, but although the need uh, for creative solutions is urgent, most of the leading democracies in the world are greatly split uh, over how we move forward. How can governments, civil society and tech develop strong coalitions, ecosystems of democracies? Autocracies seem to be very good at organizing themselves to support each other. So can you mm. give a f yeah. try to <laughs> give a fairly short answer to that and then we'll wrap up. Well, I'll give one answer, which is I also advised the European Commission on Innovation Policy and we wrote this paper called Industry 5.0, where we said that, um, you know, and it was the notion that everybody's been talking about Industry 4.0, but the Industry 4.0 completely missed the sustainability and the human-centered mm. aspect. So we launched Industry 5.0, and we said Industry 5.0 actually needs Government 5.0, because the pr this is the thing I keep on coming back to, is that we have really have to reinvent how we govern in a democratic, in an accountable way, but com it has to be become much more agile and interactive and also um, open to impulses. So I think this is something that democracies are challenged by fundamentally, because I completely agree with you that there are things that autocracies can draw upon, which is a common goal, which is large investments, mobilizing funding. Also, not negligible what you said, historically speaking, that there is this drive, which was already clear in Deng Xiaoping's speeches, about how we have to show the world that socialism works. And to show that socialism works, you also have to be successful. So I, I wouldn't neglect, I wouldn't put, put that as something negligible. But I think the question is very valid, and I think that's the one we need to pose mm. right now. Thank you, Sylvia. So we're... Uh, very soon wrapping up, and we'll go in reverse order. Uh, the question is, uh, I mean, <coughs> what excites you most uh, about tech development, building on today's discussion, and what do you see as the biggest challenge uh, going ahead? So, Bjorn, would you like to start? Yeah, well, I mean, clearly from, from a European perspective, there's lots of challenges here, and I think we, we pinpointed just a few of them. And I think the EU ha has been a, a rather effective actor for years, we talk about the Brussels effect, the ability to set norms and standards, etc. And we see it now with the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, I'm sure Kent has been wrestling with. Uh, but um, there's a limit to how, how long you can have influence only because you have a lot of consumers uh, and, and hopefully a well-functioning market. And, and what is clear is that Europe needs to kind of up its innovation game and, um, and hopefully not on in the kind of Chinese model of too much heavy-handed uh, uh, kind of political direction, but also to have lots of flowers bloom or to your, your vision. Uh, I think that that's slightly of a worry in Europe right now that there's 
quite a lot of pretty heavy-handed industrial policy in the making, and we need to make sure that that actually works for innovation and does not stop it. Mm. A lot of European flowers <laughs> <laughs> to attend to. Yeah. Uh, Jenny? <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, I just wanted to uh, uh, what you started with, Bjorn. I think with this dual use, like the understanding that all right, we're fighting climate change, or like we are dealing with these wicked problems of the world, and having that together with uh, like national, international security that we need to work together and in an agile manner. So it's like awesome. We're under attack. Let's take care of it, but not close borders, rather work together with the same cadence or different cadences, but aligned. That's really, this was so thought provoking. I have like 200 more questions. <laughs> okay, we'll Let's fix them. it. Yeah. Thanks. Let's fix it. That's great. Uh, uh, Silvia. I think we need, um, we don't necessarily need more government, but we need different governance. I think that's something to remember because there is a tendency for always more government. I don't think that's necessarily the answer. And I think we need to, as you were saying, I think we need to um, embrace instability and own it uh, and rather than trying to constantly resist it. And uh, that, those would be my takeaways from this. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. Ken, the uh, last words goes to you. Huh? Let me build on this. We, we talk a lot about the notion of responsible innovation. And if you pause for a second, you might say that's a bit of an oxymoron. Responsibility, you know, wears a suit and is very serious. And innovation is wild and creative and free. And how do you bring those two things together? It is challenging, but I think essential, because we haven't talked a lot about the next generations of technology. The artificial intelligence, which is bringing you know, language translation to the 5% the of the world's population that speaks Bengali suddenly now has a tool that can translate their language into languages around the world. We're seeing remarkable innovations that are really starting to drive our economy uh, in the way we do retail or finance or agriculture. And then the next generation of quantum mechanics, quantum computing, which is, as the head of our quantum program said, the language of nature. It's the way molecules speak with each other. And it was likely to open new frontiers in material mm -hmm. science, nuclear fusion, sustainability, water purification, all sorts of really exciting promises that are out there in 5, 10, 15 years. But to do that, we need to build social trust. We need to have a social license to be able to do this innovation in a responsible way. So I think that's the shared challenge for governments and companies moving forward. Fantastic. Thank you for ending on such a bright and positive <laughs> Uh, and, and a promising uh, note, uh, I would I'm like from to California. Say. Yeah, yeah, but that's great. We like people from California and companies from California. So, a uh, big thank you to uh, Ken, to our special guest coming all the way from the US to, uh, to today, and the three fantastic speakers, Sylvia, Jenny, and, and Bjorn, for a great discussion today. We will remain seized with this matter at the Institute, I promise. Uh, and, uh, but today, the conversation ends now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.